Philip Graham is Executive Director for Good Growth at the Greater London Authority. He started in the job at the beginning of 2020, and before that he was the Chief Executive of the National Infrastructure Commission. His, his role is to lead the GLA's work across a wide range of topics, transport and infrastructure, planning, economic development and regeneration, environmental policy, culture and European programmes. So, Philip, perhaps we can look at each of those in turn. First, uh, the def def definition of good growth is that all of London's communities will benefit from the city's growth. What impact do you see COVID-19 and the end of the Brexit transition period having on London's growth? And, and indeed, will London continue to grow? Well, I mean, I think it's important to say London at the moment has stopped growing. Um, and there's inevitably going to be a going to be a period when growth um, ceases, when we see falls in output, falls in employment. But you know, I think we do expect, and I would expect, a city that is as productive, as innovative, as as versatile as London to return to a pattern of growth over time. I mean, we're already starting to see in the UK that that, that very sudden drop that we saw over the course of sort of March, April, May is being reversed, but that fall has been so significant that it's going to take some time to uh, to come back up. And the GLA's um, forecast suggests that you know, it could be 2022 or potentially later before employment, for example comes back to pre-crisis levels and I think that's that's the really really interesting question about both this this immediate crisis but also this these two things that are coming together as Covid and Brexit intertwine I mean it isn't it either one would be an unprecedented shock on London's economy the two together all the more so and I think the two together are all the more challenging because in many cases the the sectors that are resilient to one you know, financial services has been relatively resilient to COVID because you can all, you know, we're all set, set up to deliver office work from home and so on, but are going to be hit hard by Brexit. You know, culture, food, hospitality, as long as tourists continue to flow, rel comparatively less affected by Brexit than some of these big, these big sort of service sectors. Um, they hit very very hard by COVID, so you've, you've got a, you've got a spreading of the impact of this that are that are challenging. I, I personally, I have no doubt that London will return to growth. I have no doubt that London will be successful, but it's going to take time. It's going to mean that the GLA and London's wider public sector and bodies like MLA and so on are going to have to think you know, harder and harder about what they can do to enable growth and to ensure that that growth is good growth as they enable it than perhaps they've ever done before. And the city that's going to return is going to be a slightly, you know, it's going to feel different. It's going to be a different shape. The city is going to have to adapt to this as we go forward. But my, my general view is, you know, when I, when I arrived in this job, and it was only in January, I thought that you know, the, the challenge of being executive director of good growth is that there's going to be lots of growth. We just have to make it as good as possible. We have to ensure that it, meet, it, it's, it reaches all of London's communities. It has to have to ensure that there aren't huge disparities between boroughs, that it's not environmentally unsustainable. All of those remain challenges, but we also now need to think about what we can do to sort of get that engine of growth turning again. But it, the one thing that I feel very strongly is to imagine that the right way to do so would be to step away from those principles of good growth towards something that's about growth at any cost would be a historic mistake. And I think you know, even if it delivered a short term boost to the economy, and I'm not sure that it would, um, in the long term, it would it would pull the rug away from all underneath all those things that make London attractive to investors. To foreign to foreign capital, to global talent, to big business around you know, the vibrancy of London's culture, its diversity, its green spaces, its sense of a of itself as a global city. So we have to retain that in our minds, even as we grapple with these these new challenges. And I think the the challenge of good growth remains as important as it ever has been. 
So uh, key engines of that growth, clearly uh, transport and infrastructure, and there's, uh, there are big issues for TfL's finances as a result of COVID-19, not helped by a deteriorating relationship with government. So how, how do you yeah. see that panning out over the next uh, couple of years? And uh, what delays will we see in infrastructure improvements? Um, well, I, I mean, to, to start with, I would probably challenge you a little bit. I would say that transport and infrastructure are enablers of that growth. And the growth isn't going to happen if they're not there. I think the engines of the growth are the productivity, the innovation, the, the, the agglomeration, the creativity that you see within the London economy. But, but that innovation, that creativity and everything else is gonna be stymied if people can't move around the capital, if they can't meet to talk to people, if they don't have the digital connectivity that they need, et cetera. So it's, it's, the infrastructure picture is critically important. And when we talk about challenges that we haven't seen before, the challenges for TFM in terms of its finances are unprecedented as well. We have, we're not, you know, we haven't, we've seen a recession before where people travel slightly less on the tube because economic activity is, uh, is, is held down, but that affects tube travel by you know, a handful of single percentage points. And a, a, a recession in which tube travel is actively prevented for a period because of, because of health concerns and where the process of, of moving, moving back to normal is necessarily slow because of the need to social distance is something that we're not aware of. And it's had you know, a cataclysmic effect on TfL's finances because TfL is so much more dependent on fares income than any other major urban transport system around the world. What's that going to mean for, for TfL and the infrastructure projects that it, it has planned? I think it's too early to say. Um, you know, the, the initial deal that has been done with government has um, really focused on the maintenance of the core network, on managing demand with, and on sort of dealing, enabling demand into, to be tra transported on, the, on public transport, managing demand to some degree on the road network, um, and on enabling the rollout of some of the things that have been most immediately necessary in the light of COVID. So while a certain amount of infrastructure work is going on on the rail network and so on, a big part of what we there's been a focus on has been the street space program, for example, which is about the fact that if we're now having to socially distance, if we're now more in, if we need more people to travel actively, then you have to make the road network and the pavements and so on work for that. There's now a process underway. Um, a dual process. TfL is being subject to a review of its finances undertaken by the Department for Transport. Alongside that, TfL is undertaking its own independent review, so it has a clear its its own understanding and a clear counteroffer to make to any proposals that the Department for Transport might put together. Those are ongoing. We know the financial situation is going to be is going to be challenging. I think it's accepted that you know some of the big infrastructure projects, your crossrail twos, etc., may not be able to proceed as quickly as we as we as we had hoped. I think the more the bigger question which I will be pushing for and which TfL will be pushing for is to make sure that those more immediate infrastructure projects extending out to extending the DLR out to Thames Mead um, and and those kind of things which can help right now to unlock recovery, can help right now to spur construction, to build some of the housing that we need and so on, and not treated simply as, as nice to have, and as seen as a core part of what, what TfL's job is to deliver. TfL's job is to support the vibrancy of the city. And um, you know, a, uh, an important part of that is investing in its core network. Another part of it is investing in the schemes that unlock development, and enable the city, the city to grow and change. Um, so I think that's what we need to push for. And I think it's critical that um, stakeholders across London, particularly private sector stakeholders, who we would expect this government to listen to hard, make that case as well, because these will be difficult discussions and negotiations with government. Um, I think the other thing that's really critical, probably even more so, is that the outcome of these, dis these discussions is not to, uh, to dilute or to water down London's ownership and management of its own transport network. You know, I think we have seen huge strides 
with the London Mayor in place, with TfL as a, as a strategic body overseeing the development and delivery of the transport network. And if this turns into a relationship in which we have to ask permission of central government every time we want to spend, spend any money on anything, um, then I think the agility that TfL has had, the creativity that TfL has been able to generate, um, the sheer the focus on delivery and on supporting London that TfL needs to have will be diluted as well, and I think that would be be a disaster. So, what what are the other things that Mayor can do to help get construction going again? I mean, the housing task force has uh, uh, suggested a number of things. A lot of those are dependent also on more money from central government. We've also got to urgently increase skills yeah. and hopefully get boroughs together to uh, start purchasing uh, modular constructed houses, all sorts of issues like that. Uh, what, what do you see as the key things that he needs to be doing? I think one of the things that the, mayor, that the mayor can do, which we've seen recently in the announcement he made a couple of weeks ago, is to use the systems that we've put in place, the mayor's the, the Mayor's Infrastructure Advisory Group, the relationships that we have with utilities, the infrastructure coordinators that we've been helping to place in some of the key boroughs for development across the capital, um, and use those to accelerate the delivery of the infrastructure that the capital requires on to grow. And that was the, the announcement that we made, of which was on the back of very detailed discussions with the utility providers about bringing forward around one and a half billion pounds worth of infrastructure spend that will both provide an immediate stimulus to, to growth by increasing the scale of infrastructure infrastructure construction and delivery across the capital but it also brings forward some of the some of the projects that we need to unlock development so I think that's one thing that the mayor can do I think another thing Thing that we will be that we have we have done is that we have you know, very rapidly and very successfully um, switched our our planning functions to uh, to operate virtually. We've held our first our first sort of planning planning inquiry session virtually, and we've got others planned. We've been maintaining the pace of delivery in terms of planning applications and so on, and have received extremely heartening feedback from, from the development community and others about how effective and how seamless that has been. So I think that's another thing that we've been able to do. And actually, one of the things that's interesting about this, this crisis is that while construction has had to take a step back, now actually, the, the progress through the, the, the progress of planning applications has been, has been maintained. So as social distancing kind of comes to an end, and as the, the economy does begin to return to a pattern of growth, I think we'll have a really strong platform to move forward from. And I think the other part of it comes back to that housing task force report. Um, and unfortunately, in many cases, these are issues where we need support from central government. But we do need to move forward with the housing infrastructure fund bids, the government needs to and and we will be looking, I hope for additional funding through that route for some of the uh, some of the infrastructure schemes that can unlock growth. Um, the government needs to, act, needs to accept that the best way to get the country building again, not just London, is for there to be proper funding for affordable housing to drive that forward. And, and I suspect you want to ask me about this next, or if not next, fairly soon, um, we need the government to enable us to publish the London plan mm and to really move forward in implementing the policies that are within that, which we think are going to address some of the, some of the challenges of COVID-19, are going to provide the certainty that you need to move forward in terms of housing delivery, um, and are going to drive up the quality of the built environment in the, in the capital and of, new develop, of the new developments that we want to see. So in terms of the London plan, uh, what sort of progress are you making with discussions with MHCLG? And in the context of that, what are your concerns uh, uh, for the future of London Plan in the light of the new planning white paper? D does it uh, uh, mean that it has to change? Um, the, we're, finding, we're finding, if I'm honest, the relationship with MHCLG quite frustrating. We, we wrote to them a good couple of months ago, probably longer, with what we thought was a very reasonable and a very coherent response 
to the to the questions they raised and the directions that they proposed in relation to the London the London plan. We're not seeking to we we weren't seeking a fight. No, we were seeking to continue to move this process forward to a to a resolution. But we've had very little response on that so far, and we certainly haven't had any kind of formal response from the Secretary of State. So we are continuing to to press MHCLG officials to understand where that where where their thinking is at. We will continue to engage very constructively, but it's hugely frustrating that at a point where we felt we could have had the London plan out and agreed by now with a bit of, of a small amount of give and take, we're not we're not quite there at the moment. And I think the challenge within that is that the changes that we have seen, both the, the sort of the, the, the concrete changes that are proposed to use classes and permitted development rights and so on, but also the proposed changes that are set out in the planning white paper, um, you know, pose some challenges, some quite severe challenges to the, to the delivery of the goals within the, within the London plan. Um, you know, the government is the government's own advisors have highlighted the challenges for for quality and other things of expanding permitted development rights too far. Um, the use class piece feeds directly into how the how the London plan has sought to um, do things like protect the the scale of industrial the scale of industrial land to support intensification of that to get a better mix of uses in town centres and high streets and so on. So we've been we've been looking at the plan just to just to make sure that it still functions in that new world. Um, but I think the real challenge for us is how if the government is going to take forward its proposals as set out in the planning white paper. And we have quite serious concerns with some of them, but clearly the government has set out a very strong position here. How does that interact with the the systems and the structures that are put in place within London? The London plan can operate in, di with, in different modes of, within which the planning system might work, but I'm yet to meet anyone, quite seriously yet to meet anyone, who feels that the dilution of that sort of regional planning structure within London would be a good idea. And in my previous role with the National Infrastructure Commission, I did a lot of work on things like the Cambridge Oxford arc um, on some of the issues around sort of uh, economic growth and delivery in the north of England and in every case one of the key challenges people people raised to actually being able to deliver the housing the economic activity the growth that they wanted was the lack of a regional planning framework so to then be at risk find yourself in a position where there's a risk of that being diluted or even dismantled in London I think is a real worry um, and for all that the and and that feeds into the delivery of housing because it feeds into it, it it sort of takes away from that strategic overview it feeds into questions about whether we will be able to continue to maintain and improve the right mix between commercial industrial housing recreational but it also feeds directly into these questions of quality of quality and these questions of how you can deliver good growth by design and I think underpinning this, my big worry is that for all that, the question of quality is talked about at some length, and that's encouraging within the planning white paper. The direction of travel in other parts of the forest from government around, for example, the expansion of permitted development rights is taking you in completely the opposite direction. And I, and I think it will be really critical, and I think we need to make the case that effective community involvement and democratic involvement in planning decisions will continue to be critical to keep quality where you want it. Um, effective master planning, proper scrutiny of, of planning applications and, and, uh, and, and building proposal, um, and critically, a, an ability to actually focus on and drive up the quality of design and if we are to go down this route how these design codes operate will be an, an unimaginably important part of this and that's an area where we really need to understand and to influence how this plays out in the London context. So in the future we are going to see some pretty big shifts one would think in London's economy uh, the impact on the hosp hospitality, tertiary education, cultural sectors uh, is huge and, and, and will be huge over the next couple of years. 
So can we look to areas like tech and biomeds, which have benefited from COVID-19 to deliver growth? And what other areas do you feel uh, will be supporting London's economy in the future? Um, I, I think, for, first of all, I think um, that we will see, I, I, I think there will be a pattern of a return to growth in some of these sectors over in the in a not too distant future. I mean, we need to wait until the the effects of the pandemic are are subsiding. But, you know, arts and the arts and culture sector, the food sector, the hospitality sector are not going to cease to be um, drivers of growth and attractors of of people into into London. And so, I don't you know, I don't think the 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 we're going to end up with some kind of complete donut in which the central zone sort of fall, falls away. But even even but you know, but there will need to be a more sustainable equilibrium. And you know, I don't think looking to support the central zone is in conflict with some of these alternative sort of ideas around 15-minute cities and around neighborhood living and around sort of supporting the, the town centers and the high streets in 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 or and outer London. I think they 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 pull together because what we need to find in a world in which COVID-19 hasn't it hasn't fundamentally broken the mold, it's accelerated changes that we're going to see already. But those changes are driving us to a different kind of balance. And I think the, these, these, these projects and programmes and ideas are about getting that balance right. Within that, I think there are going to be set, there are inevitably going to be sectors that are that are particularly critical to growth as we go forward. I think you're right. Tech and digital is likely to be one of those. Health and social care is going to continue to be, be a growing sector and a source of growth within London. And that's both from the very, very, you know, high skill, high knowledge industry, sort of life sciences sector, all the way down to the fact that, you know, London will inevitably have a growing social care sector that generates jobs for people who, who, who are able to care for us as we get older, who are able to run those facilities and so on, because we, we know we have an aging population like the, rest of, like the rest of Europe and a real challenge to deal with that. Um, the green sector show, has shown remarkable resilience to previous recessions, I think will be, will be important in this recession as well, but both as a spur to growth, but, because, but also because we can't step away from our responsibilities to reduce emissions, to tackle pollution, to increase green space within the capital. And I think the, the sort of the idea of a Green New Deal is going to be critical to recovery. And there will be, and that will involve looking at sort of the, the efficiency of our buildings. It will be looking at how we can generate energy more effectively in the capital as well as drawing from it outside the capital. It's going to look at sort of the green cover within the city and continuing the good work that has happened already around tackling air pollution. And I think it's important also not to forget that there's growing evidence of a strong link between air pollution and, and the impacts of COVID-19. So that, that, that works in all directions. And I think the other, the other area that I would draw attention to, which I think will, will be important, is going back to the cultural and creative industries. And they're going through, particularly on the arts and culture side, they're going through a genuinely unprecedentedly, I keep using that phrase, but it's true, um, traumatic experience. I chair the board of the New Dharama Theatre in Camden. And, you know, we have never, we, we have spent a decade getting ourselves to, to sort of a quite healthy state of financial viability, and that's been wiped out within a period a period of two or three months and we are we can we are doing everything that we can to allow us to 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 survive as an organization into the early part of next year in the hope that we can begin to begin to operate again all the while maintaining links with the artists that we work with with the companies that we've supported in the past to try and give ourselves a chance of rebuilding that ecosystem but as we move forward you know, the the culture and the creative cultural sector and the creative industries are one of London's in absolute bedrocks of its economy, both in terms of the jobs they they that are derived within them directly and the reputational benefit and the and the sort of promotional benefit that that brings for the capital as a as a whole. And you know we are continuing to see investment. We see what's going on in Dagenham with regard to the studios down there. We've also secured some money from government for Three Mills Island. Um, we're continuing to see innovation in how we can how we can create performance, how we can create art. The museums are starting to open up, and I think this this is these are sectors that are 
that are used to dealing with challenges. This is a bigger challenge than they have seen perhaps ever before. But if we can help them at this stage to navigate that, and you know, uh, programs like the Mayor's Cultural Risk Fund have been a real help with that, then they will blossom and grow in future and, and they will continue to be an important part of London's economic sort of vibrancy. Excellent. Finally, uh, one of your list of jobs is looking after European programmes. I presume that job will uh, disappear, will it, on January the 1st, 2021, or will we still have connections with Europe through the GLA? Um, it's not going to disappear, actually. And one of the one of the things that was agreed when the when the original Brexit deal was done. I mean, we're still waiting for the uh, for the trade deal that's that, that's planned to be agreed, assuming it assuming it will be. But the the exit package that was agreed said that these European programmes would continue until their their agreed end date. So actually, we will be continuing to receive and spend quite significant sums of European structural funding um, through the period to 2023, um, which is excellent. Um, but we're not going to after 2023, and there is, there is a taper over that period. So alongside making the best possible use of that funding, another critical job for us, no less than for other metro mayors and for um, public authorities in other parts of the country, is to make the case to government that this funding needs to be replaced. The government has spoken about a shared prosperity fund, but it's little more than a slogan at the moment. And I think it's critical that we make the case that the, the level of funding that London receives through that needs to be maintained and that, the, uh, and that London's role in the distribution of that funding needs to be maintained. And, and that comes back to my final point, which kind of brings, brings me around to where we started about sort of the principles of good growth. And that's that there is a lot of talk in the country at the moment. It's one of the, the government's favourite slogans about the idea of levelling up. And, you know, levelling up tends to mean at the moment shorthand for, for moving prosperity, for, for shifting prosperity out of the southeast in London towards the north of the country and to the periphery of the country. And I don't think anyone argues with the fact that there is a need to support growth outside, outside the capital, outside the southeast. But I think we mustn't lose sight of the fact that there's a levelling up agenda within London itself. And the, the disparities of, in prosperity, the disparities in life chances, the disparities in health outcomes within the capital are no less severe than the disparities across the country. And we absolutely mustn't let the government think, forget that when it thinks about what the program of what is what a suite of policies to address the levelling up challenge are. I think that's going to be critical for us as we respond, as we recover from COVID, given everything that we know about the deep inequalities that. Uh, that this disease has revealed within the capital and within the country as a whole. Well, thank you very much, Philip Graham, for giving us your insights into delivering good growth for London. And look forward to talking again soon. Cheerio.